Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third lecture of our online lecture series, Scientifically Speaking, an hour of knowledge sharing and interaction with the world expert designed just for you. I am Anna Upreti, a first year student at Ashoka University, doing a double major in economics and computer science. At Ashoka, I've had the unique opportunity to explore some of the pressing problems of our planet and think through them with leading scientists from a multitude of fields. Our aim with this lecture series is to introduce you to these cutting edge research and innovative teaching techniques of our thought leaders. With a new topic and expert each time, you will join us on a journey to explore a particular subject area from the perspective of data and science. At the end, the speaker will answer all your burning questions. Before I introduce our speaker for today, just a few logistics for this lecture. Our moderator, Professor Debayan Gupta, will interview the speaker for about 30 minutes, after which you can ask questions using the Q&A feature on Zoom. You can choose to share your name or send in your questions anonymously. All seminars are recorded and will be uploaded on Ashoka University's YouTube page for those who may have missed it or wish to revisit it later. We will share the link for you, the entire series, with you soon. Lastly, there will be a quiz to test your knowledge after this lecture, and the top five winners will get a very exciting hamper from Ashoka. I would now like to introduce one of my favorite professors at Ashoka and our moderator for tonight, Professor Debayan Gupta. Professor Gupta is currently an assistant professor of computer science at Ashoka University, where he teaches courses on security, privacy, and takes the introductory programming class. He's currently a visiting professor and research affiliate at MIT, where he was previously a faculty member. His primary areas of research are secure computation and cryptography. Thank you so much for joining us today, Professor. Thank you, Anna, for that wonderful introduction. I'm sure it has nothing to do with the fact that you're currently awaiting a grade on said introductory programming class. I wouldn't be so sure, Professor. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Um, our speaker for today is Professor Sudha Rajamani, who will be addressing the topic chemical origins of life. She did her bachelor's from Hyderabad and got a master's in life sciences from the University of Madras. She then did a PhD in biochemistry from the National Institute of Immunology at New Delhi. Currently, she's an associate professor and deputy chair in the biology department at the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research at Pune, where she runs a group interested in all topics pertaining to the chemical origins of life. We're so honored to have you here, Professor. Thank you so much, Anna. It's wonderful to be here. Professor, can you tell us a bit more about your journey and research and how you got into researching the chemical origins of life? Uh, so I've always been a lover of biology. I went on to do my PhD in biochemistry. And at that point, I predominantly worked on uh, disease-related aspects on sickle cell anemia and later on went on to do a postdoc in Parkinson's disease. However, a series of absolutely unplanned events kind of set me on this journey that brought me to this field of astrobiology. And, um, you know, just fell in love with the field, decided to stay on, came back to India, started a lab in it. And that's what we do now, try and answer questions that allow us to understand how life might have originated on Earth. <laughs> that, that, that thing you said, hi, Sudha, the thing you said okay. about uh, unplanned events really resonates with me. I think uh, I also started out with uh, AI and robotics as my initial career when I started my PhD but a similar perhaps set of unplanned events. I like to joke that it took the fun out of funding, uh, caused me to pivot to cryptography and computer security. Uh, I suspect that there are very, very many researchers who pivot perhaps multiple times in their careers. Absolutely, I concur. Uh, in any case, thank you, Anna, for introducing the both of us. Uh, I hope you'll remain with us throughout the talk and be back for the quiz at the end. Uh, so that, uh, Let's get okay. started. Sure. Then. I'm just about to share the screen with you people. Just give me one second. Can you all see the screen? Is everybody able to see the screen? Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. Um, so my first question to you for the evening is going to perhaps be the easiest one and the most difficult one. 
when I read the question, the first thing I thought, uh, like a good, any good academician, is instead of answering it, I'll deconstruct the question itself. So when you're talking about the chemical origins of life, how do you define life? So that's a really, like you said, a very simple yet a very profound question. So there are several hundreds of definitions out there, but we sort of work within the constraints of a definition that got ratified by a bunch of astrobiologists whose specific job was to figure this out. And according to that definition, life is a self-sustaining chemical reaction that is capable of growth, replication, and Darwinian evolution. So if it has these hallmarks, then one can identify those sets of interacting molecules as living. That's fascinating. Sorry, it just reminds me of the whole uh, Diogenes with the plucked uh, chicken thing to define a human. So in a similar fashion, if you were to deconstruct this, how, how does one break down or discern this process and break it down into different fields of science? Because you're, you're talking about a lot of different things there. So one of the uh, important things to sort of start with is to first understand that there is this absolutely amazing continuum that exists between physics, chemistry, and biology. And what do I mean by that? So if you zoom into your cells and my cells, you basically see that it is composed of a bunch of interacting polymers of various types. And this is biology. And you zoom further in into one of these biopolymers, you actually see that it is a conglomeration or a large ag aggregate that essentially is formed from the result of interactions between smaller chemical entities, which in turn are formed by the interaction of atoms. So there you see that there is this continuum between physics, the atoms, chemistry, the small molecules, and biology, the larger conglomeration of molecules, which essentially is thought to have led to uh, the transition from chemistry to biology on early earth. So the way to think about it is to say, how do we go from the space where you have all these interesting molecules, simple molecules, the chemical space, to more complex molecules, which is the biological space? Super interesting. So again, you've given me a, you've given me a what, but I'll, I'll go even deeper into it, which is how do you get these molecules in the first place? What, what is required to make this stuff happen? So as you can see, these two pictures here, show you that these particular molecules can actually form in the interstellar medium in the outer space, not just simple chemical molecules. More recently, they've also discovered these really large complex carbon spheres, which are made up of 60 atoms of carbon to get, uh, they come together to form these hollow spheres. So how did these molecules eventually make it onto earth, which is where this saga of life even happened? There are two schools of thought. I mean, there are, the, it is thought that it might've happened in two different ways. One is by exogenous delivery. What do we mean by that? These organic molecules that are formed in the interstellar medium can ride on planetary objects like meteors, comets, and they actually get delivered onto Earth when they bombard Earth every now and then. It happens even today. But back uh, in the early history of life, it is thought it is thought that there was this really intense period where this bombardment happened nonstop, which is what brought in a lot of these molecules onto Earth. In the other, um, in the other uh, scenario, even terrestrial environments can allow for the synthesis of these molecules given the right ingredients. And here you see a volcanic geothermal pool where you can have these, uh, if you have the precursor monomers present, one can actually have these complex molecules form in these scenarios. And these are the two ways in which the original chemical inventory of molecules is thought to have happened on the early Earth. That is really, really cool. And um, yeah, so when, when you kind of think about this continuum between physics and uh, chemistry and biology, one starts thinking about okay, awesome, all of this is happening. You eventually form this, these lovely complex molecules, but then how do we even start understanding how the most primitive of all entities on the earth, how might have that come about? So here's a, a slide, here's a slide now. And you see that there are a lot of these pictures in here, some mushrooms, there's T-Rex, and there's Nelson Mandela, a catfish, giant sequoias, bacteria, what is interesting is there is something common to all of them. And Debayan, um, as a, a computer geek, I wonder if you know what might be the least common multiple between all of these things that are shown here. I'm going to be unspeakably brave and guess cells. 
Wonderful, so cells. And cells are the fundamental unit of all life. Here in this slide, you'll see the depiction of two different kinds of cells. On the left side is the prokaryotic cell, which is supposed to be the most simplest of all life forms that is thought to have emerged on the early earth very, very early on, which eventually led to the uh, emergence of slightly more complex cells. And the big difference between the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells is the fact that your eukaryotic cells have nucleus, uh, sort of a demarcated space where you have the genetic material, whereas your prokaryotic cell doesn't have it. And what is amazing is even this most simplistic uh, form of life, which is the prokaryotes, is just not simple because it allows us to understand what are the limits of uh, environmental conditions that they can thrive in even to this day. What am I showing here? I'm showing you four panels of pictures, images. Basically, these are uh, depictions of environments of extreme conditions. In one case, you have really high salt concentrations in the lower left panel. In the lower right panel, the temperatures are really, really, uh, really, really low in these conditions. On the left top panel, uh, it's basically all these lovely colors that you see are actually microorganisms, which can survive extremely high UV conditions. And on the right side, top panel, you have hyperthermophiles, which are organisms that can even live in temperatures where you and I would completely fry and cease to exist. So this complexity of life, starting from the most simplest forms of life to the most complex humans, can be plotted on this one uh, uh, tree of life, whose very simplistic depiction is shown here on the left panel. And if you can see the three big domains of life, the bacteria, the eukaryotes, and the archaea are thought to have emerged way back from this one single last universal common ancestor or the LUCA. And this was the sort of prevalent thought for the longest time, though research coming out in the last couple of decades is slightly sort of uh, uh, has modified this image to look more like this. And what is happening here? You still have the three domains of life and there's a lot of crosstalk between the three domains of life. However, at the base, you don't now have a single last universal common ancestor, but it is thought that it was a common ancestral community of primitive cells that are thought to have led to eventually all this complexity that we see on earth today. Okay, that's very cool, but I have a question for you right there. So I see bacteria and I see eukaryotes. I've heard of those two things before. Mm -hmm. uh, what are archaea? So it turns out if you look under the microscope, your archaea is going to look exactly like a bacteria. And up till the 1960s, it was thought it was actually clubbed into this one single domain. However, very quickly, scientists realized that archaea is, are, are as far away from bacteria as you and I are far away from bacteria. So it, it kind of got classified in its own domain of life. The cool thing about archaea are it, can, it, it comprises of a whole bunch of microorganisms that thrive in extreme conditions. And very interestingly, a lot of them do not need too much of oxygen to survive. They can live in very low oxygen conditions or even in anoxic, completely anoxic conditions. Whoa, that's fascinating. Somehow I had just assumed that oxygen was always necessary. You know, the no, the, for the longest time, Earth did not have oxygen, and I'll get to that story a little later. Okay, but first, you've told us about this LUCA thing. I like the acronym, but it's a very nice theory. How does one prove it? So here's the challenge, right? So when you're talking about these ancestral community of primitive cells, what are we, what are we exactly uh, saying? We in the field call these cells protocells. It's essentially like a tennis ball where the outer skin or the lipid membrane is made up of this class of molecules called amphiphiles or more specifically lipids. And within them, it's thought that they encapsulated some kind of a genetic material and some kind of a minimal metabolic network that allows it to, it to sustain itself. The problem though is that these kinds of entities don't leave any signatures for us to be able to track them, like the case, like in the case of fossils. Um, and what is interesting, though, is despite these issues, one can still be confident enough that these are the kind of entities that probably existed way before life as we know it emerged. And how do we know this? 
based on the evidence that has come from the extremophilic studies that biologists have carried out, some of the geochemical studies that the chemists and the, uh, and the geologists have carried out, and by looking at some of the evidence of the oldest form of life that still exists. Yes, it's been a long journey uh, thus far, 60 years, but very happy to share that a lot of the pieces of the puzzle are finally coming into view. That's super cool. So I'm gonna ask what's probably a really stupid question right now, um, but that image on the right of the screen, the artist's depiction, that looks very much like something we've been seeing far too often on our screens, on our TV screens recently. Uh, any connection there or do lots of different cells look like the coronavirus? Ah, so that's interesting. Um, I, I, I can see why you think it looks like the coronavirus because your coronavirus is also made of a genetic material that is encapsulated by a lipid protein kind of a membranous skin. However, you remember the definition of life that I alluded to at the very beginning of the talk? Based on that, life is a self-sustained chemical system that is capable of growth, replication, and Darwinian evolution. The problem with viruses is that they are not self-sustained. They basically need some kind of a host cell to survive, either an animal host of some sort, your pangolins, or your bats, or dogs, or chick uh, hens, or a human host. So by that, uh, very definition, I'm sorry, viruses do not make the cut for living entities. Uh, at this juncture, what I would like to do is to give you a sense of how these protocells are thought to have come about on the early earth. And I'm going to use a little video uh, to kind of uh, illustrate this to you. So very early on, it was thought that um, there was this mysterious force called the vital force that powered all of life. However, Frederick Wohler in 1828 for the first time showed that you could make urea completely from chemicals in the lab. So he basically made pee without peeing. And what this showed to scientists of that time is one did not require this mysterious force to form life or living entities. One could basically just think of something else which is much more readily studied and understandable. And that is chemical reactions. Chemical reactions are thought to have occurred between entities which form from simpler atoms, and these molecules are thought to have led to the formation of life. So what is chemistry? It's fundamentally the study of matter, where you can try and understand how atoms came together to form small molecules, and then how these small molecules came together to form conglomerates of larger molecules. A subset of these larger molecules are the special molecules that encompass life and are present in cells. So some of these monomers that form the larger oligomers like your genes, as is shown here in DNA or protein or your cell membrane, very early on was thought that could not, these molecules could not have been formed without invoking life. But then now we know that you can actually form this simply by chemical means. So that's super duper interesting, but um, and I can see you have a bunch of different topics there around uh, astrobiology. And I, I was thinking about this, how, how do you like, it's easy enough to say all these things, but how do you bring them together? Because the first time you, I heard astrobiology, I imagined someone looking through a telescope at a cell or something, you know? But yeah. uh, you, you've brought in chemistry, you've brought in physics, you've brought in, I was thinking paleontology as well, because you're sort of going back to the time of dinosaurs and very far beyond that. So how do you actually bring all of these ideas together uh, into a coherent field of science? So this coherent field of science is called astrobiology, which essentially allows us to study the emergence, the distribution and the evolution of life on earth and in the universe. And the coolest thing about astrobiology is that it is one amazing interdisciplinary area of science. It feeds off of inputs coming in from astronomy, all the way from astronomy to biology, and ecology. And I didn't put math explicitly out there, but you know that math essentially fuels a bunch of these different sciences that is out there. That has, uh, that has been mentioned out there. So this amazing field is super interdisciplinary, which is also one of the reasons why I got very excited to start my uh, area of work in this particular aspect. And in our lab, we try and understand how you go from these primitive, mo simple molecules to the oldest of cells called primitive cells. And in our own lab, we actually use 
tools from a few different scientific areas, including biochemistry, molecular biology, biophysics, chemistry, and so on. And very importantly, a lot of these processes are super complex. So we cannot encapsulate all of this within, uh, within uh, tabletop experiments. So sometimes you have to actually invoke the help of computers. And for that, we collaborate with colleagues in the field who are really good at modeling some of these things. Yeah, so maybe Debayan uh, would be interested in understanding when these processes might have happened uh, back on the early Earth. So here is a timeline of the early history of life on Earth. And this is kind of a little dated because you can see that it's from 2002. And since then we have learned a lot more, but this is reasonably um, accurate for all practical purposes. And what am I showing here? I'm showing you that this transition from non-life to life, which I'm talking about, the transition from chemistry to biology is predominantly thought to have happened between this time period, that is around 3.8 to 4.2. And now it's even sort of moved to actually completely closer to when the stable hydrosphere came about. So these processes is thought to have occurred within this period of time on the early earth. And if I take this linear sort of uh, timeline and put it in a 24 hour clock, this is what you're seeing here. At t is equal to zero, it's basically midnight. And at around 4 billion years is when you started seeing some of the oldest known rock uh, records that, uh, rock, rock records that exist. So I want you to remember this clock because we're going to keep seeing this clock in a few other slides further down during the talk which will make you appreciate how much has gone into the emergence and subsequent evolution of life before we came to walk on this planet. So what set the stage before all of this saga started, all of this drama started? We have to go back all the way to 4.5 billion years ago, which is when the solar system first formed. And why is this important? All that interesting chemistry that I've been talking to you about happened in the interstellar and the circumstellar medium. And a lot of it happened during the birth and the death of stars. And a lot of that is tied up to the formation of the solar system and subsequently to the formation of the moon, which essentially is thought to have been a result of the collision of two giant bodies like Earth and a Mars-sized object called Thea. But what is interesting is what happened between the 3.8 and 4.1 billion years which is when this event called the late heavy bombardment period is sought to have happened when these extra planetary objects kept bombarding onto Earth. And what are these? These are the meteorites, the comets, and a lot of these uh, bombardment events brought a lot of the organics that we eventually see in the chemical in the inventory. It was all brought during this period is sort of the big argument. However, new research is beginning to slightly question this, but this is the nature of science. We talk about something, soon something comes up and then we start debating and then we start evolving better models. And one of the last things I want to talk about here on this slide is the formation of oceans. And why is that important? Crust and oceans, that is essentially what allowed for life to even emerge, the chemistry to even transition to biology. Without water, there's no life. Water is one of the very important biosignatures that is used even now when we send out uh, all these missions to different other planets and to other, other uh, non-Earth uh, uh, entities in the solar system. If you want to look for signatures of life, you will look for signature of water. And this event is roughly thought to have happened about 4 billion years ago, but the jury is a bit out there regarding this. And this brings me to how might have the Earth looked like 3.8 to 4.1 billion years ago. On the top left panel, you actually see this really hot simmering Earth. It looks nothing like how it looks today, right? So back then it was super hot and eventually when it calmed down, a lot of volcanic, in, uh, volcanic islands are thought to have come about at the edge of which a lot of interesting uh, chemistry is thought to have been facilitated, which was important for the emergence of life. That was the story back then. How does the earth look now? Like the beautiful blue marble, which Carl Sagan famously called the pale blue dot. And even to date, you actually have these volcanic um, geo, uh, geological features dotting the planet, and that is what is shown on the right bottom panel of the screen. Ooh, that, that, that picture looks really great. Um, let's see if uh, our audience can guess uh, what causes those vibrant colors and do a poll. Okay, let's see.
it's extremely sort of um, it's extremely obvious if you know the answer. Otherwise, it could be a little. <laughs> so yeah, let's see. Let's see how this goes. I'm very curious to see what the answer will look like. Yeah, uh, we'll give you another 20 seconds or 30 seconds to do the book. All right, everyone who's listening. Have you ever been to one of these uh, volcanic uh, sort of uh, geological uh, spaces that exist on? Sadly, I have not. The closest I've gotten was the Peabody Museum over in New Haven. Uh, and, and that had a very nice sort of uh, fake version of one, ah, uh, along with the researchers who were supposed to be researching it. So they had sort of fake toilet paper on the side of it too. <laughs> I see. Oh, wow. I think we're going right. to have to... Ha, huh, look at that. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. So let me, let me just quickly read that out. 16% uh, think it's lava, 29% think it's minerals, 23% think it's microbes, and 32% think it's chemical reactions. So Siddha, would you like to reveal the answer? The, 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 the answer is microbes. I can actually see how people thought it could be minerals too. And please don't forget that a lot of the chemical reactions essentially allow for these microorganisms to thrive in these environments. But the correct answer is microorganisms. All of that, all of those gorgeous colors that you see out there is the result of microbes thriving in those locations, completely exploiting the crazy parameters that exist there in terms of temperatures, pHs, in terms of the kind of rock chemistry that's possible. And that will change the kind of colors you see in these scenarios. Interesting. So, I mean, you're showing some very sort of corner cases, some interesting geological niches, etc. So are, are these the only places where primitive cells and eventually life grew out of? Or was it a more homo homogenous thing where different things emerged in different spaces or something? So this sort of uh, uh, brings us to the kind of geological niches on the early earth that we think might have supported these life uh, forming reactions. And basically, um, depending upon whom you talk to in the field, there are two, diff two big schools of thoughts. Uh, on the left, you basically see uh, what is called a hydrothermal vent. It, is, uh, it exists on the ocean floor and is a result of volcanic activity in the ocean floor. And this particular one is a black smoker because the gas it billows out is black in color and that completely is because of the chemistry that's feasible there. It's thought that these niches might have allowed for extremely interesting chemical and thermal fluxes that allowed for the out of equilibrium reactions that essentially what is essential, which essentially is the hallmark of, hallmark of life. These reactions could have been very readily facilitated there. On the right side are the terrestrial geothermal pools, which very much exist on the surface of the earth. And this particular one is from Bumpus Hill in Mount Lassen in California that I've been to. And, um, these niches also, even if they look a little less sexier than the black smokers, these niches also uh, facilitate extremely interesting thermal and chemical fluxes, which allow for uphill reactions, which are pertinent to life processes to occur. And we think, and particularly in my lab, we are interested in evaluating these terrestrial geothermal niches for what they can do. And that is sort of what I'm going to concentrate on during the rest of the talk. Okay, so I'm going to focus on one of the words you said, which is terrestrial. Um, now, the images you showed me are really cool, and I realize this might be a stupid question, but they look really alien to me, for the lack of a better word. Um, is there something special about Earth, or can these kinds of vents or black smokers or whatever, do, can these exist elsewhere? So, uh, so it turns out this is not unique to our planet at all. Um, I uh, wonder if you've heard about one of Satan's moons. I'm going to use that as an example. Satan has a moon called Enceladus, and Enceladus spews off this hydrogen gas that, can, that kind of cannot be accounted for. The amount of hydrogen gas that's spewed by Enceladus is so large, and that is thought that it, it is thought that it cannot be possible unless and until there is some sort of geothermal activity that is prevalent on Enceladus' surface. So yes, these niches are not necessarily unique to our planet at all. These could be present on other extra Earth, uh, uh, other, other uh, objects, even in our solar system, or even on other exoplanets that exist outside of our solar system. Super cool. So let's uh, continue with how it might have occurred on uh -huh. the Earth. 
yeah so just to kind of get back to the terrestrial aspect of what you brought, uh, what you mentioned in the previous slide here are two images which show these terrestrial geothermal environments that very much exist to date one uh, on the left is Kamchatka hot spring, which is found on the Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia. On the right side is, if I'm not wrong, a geyser called the Old Faithful that is found in the Yellowstone National Park. So if one can, in principle, go and study uh, these kinds of processes, even in these settings, but a lot of the times we end up simulating these processes, uh, these environments in the lab to try and understand how processes pertaining to the emergence of older cells might have come about. So what is the model that exists out there for the emergence of the most primitive cells in these niches? And this is the slide that explains it. So, uh, in panel A, you're essentially looking at the edge of a tidal pool or a geothermal pool, yeah? Given the right kind of monomers in them, which is the monomers that eventually form the membrane of the cell and the monomers that can form the genetic uh, component of the cell, if they're present in the same space, a lot of interesting things are possible. Firstly, let's concentrate on the lipid monomers. Lipid monomers are essentially molecules as shown by these two squiggly lines here. They are amphiphilic molecules which have a water-loving head group and a water-hating tail. The water-hating tail is predominantly carbon-based. The water-loving head, uh, head groups have atoms in there which love to interact with water. So as soon as these molecules see water, the water-hating groups are going to come next to each other as shown in this cartoon here to ward off all the water from, near, from around them. And this essentially allows only the water loving head groups to face outside. So in the, these are called higher ordered structures and you can have different kinds of structures like micelles, bilayers, and if the bilayers become large enough, they become very unstable, fold back on themselves and form these tennis ball like structures like I've been showing you and they're called vesicles. Under a dry state, and when does that happen? These wet dry cycles are very common geological events that happen even today on Earth. They're driven by day-night cycles, daytime temperatures are high, a lot, uh, lot of evaporation, dry condition, nighttime temperatures are low, a lot of condensation, rehydration. So during one such dehydration stage, these higher order lipid entities can actually form these parallel white lined kind of sandwich like structures which is actually shown in a real microscopic image, a freeze fracture image of a synthetic lipid that you can work with in the lab. So if you have these red dots that are the monomeric entities that essentially can form the genetic polymer, you can now constrain these molecules in a close enough space where they can start interacting with each other better and form longer polymers. On a subsequent rehydration stage, like once again, night happens, temperatures cool down and there's water activity again, or if you're at the edge of a tidal pool, water comes in, wet cycle, water goes out, dry cycle. So when a new cycle of water comes in, you can actually have these multilamellar sandwich-like structures start blebbing out once again into these cell-like entities. But now what they do is they encapsulate the growing oligomer within them. And that is why you're seeing this particular bilayered structure with these red polymeric entities within them. And it is thought that multiple cycles of dehydration, rehydration, and some kind of a primitive selection is thought to have what uh, is, are thought to, uh, are thought to have been the processes that led to the emergence of protocells on Earth. So one of the important theories that hypothesized how all of this might have come about, happened on the early Earth, goes back to these very two famous scientists that are shown here. On the left with that lovely French beard is uh, Operan, he's a Russian scientist. On the right is an American scientist, J.B.S. Haldane, who has a very interesting Indian connection that Dave is very excited about. It goes back to uh, Kolkata and West Bengal. Um, so the two of these people, no emails, no phones, nothing back then, independently came up with this absolutely gorgeous theory. And it's now famously called the Operan Haldane theory. And according to this theory, if you had the fundamental inorganic molecules present on early Earth, given the right conditions, that is under high temperatures and with a lot of energy either coming from lightning or from the ultraviolet radiation of the sun, these molecules can now come talk to each other. And back then, it's thought that they were the Earth, Earth's condition was very uh, Earth's environment was very reducing. That basically means there were a lot of electrons on the early Earth, which can readily uh, sort of interact with these molecules to form new molecules. And under these conditions, you can go from inorganic molecules to what we are kind of very loosely showing here as a string of pearls, 
but these are organic molecules, which are the fundamental monomeric units of proteins. And the one cool thing is uh, that, uh, that I want to sort of mention here is you see the primordial soup out here, JBS Haldane particularly coined this term where he said that your, uh, your prebiotic ocean was this vast, amazing laboratory. And if it had the right ingredients back then, given the right energy sources, one can actually see how these things can beautifully emerge organic molecules from inorganic molecules. That's fascinating, Sudha, and thank, double thank you for the Bengali Connect. Uh, I, I am indeed a very big uh, fan of Haldane, and I'd recommend uh, Possible Worlds and other essays by him to absolutely everybody. And I absolutely. think he also worked on uh, sickle cell disease and did really? a bunch of genetic work, yeah. Absolutely. Um, now, I'm gonna ask you another irritating question now. Now you've given me a mod, something called a model. And since you're talking about this theory, this hypothesis must have been proved somehow. Um, how would you even go about proving something like this? So one of the important things I want to mention here is something fundamental to all of science uh, uh, divine. And this is something you appreciate too. Theories are beautiful. It's important to have theories which are in turn sort of rooted in something that we already understand in some form or shape. However, a theory stays a theory unless and until it's proved otherwise, one way or the other, right? So the first proof came from this absolutely enigmatic experiment that was conducted by Miller and Urey, Harold Urey and Stanley Miller. And this happened in 1953. Turns out the very same year when the double helix structure of DNA was actually discerned by Watson and Crick with a lot of help from Rosalind Franklin, which they did not give a lot of, whom they did not give a lot of credit, but don't forget that. This is the same year in which Miller-Urey experiment happened. So what did Miller do? Miller basically told Harold, I want to come and try out this thing that O'Paran and Haldane talked about. I actually want to take a bunch of inorganic molecules like methane, ammonia, water, and in the presence of hydrogen gas. I would like to simulate the prebiotic ocean, which is what they did in this little sort of uh, vessel down here, which is right above your Bunsen burner. And when you heat it up, you have all these gases coming out and the water vapor coming out, which carries these gases to the space where you can simulate a lightning-like scenario by apply, applying a tungsten electrode uh, to that space. And voila, beautiful chemistry happens there. And once again, those gases pass through a condenser, cold water is passing around this condenser. So the gas once again becomes liquid, which you can collect. And once it comes down here, you can collect it and actually systematically study them. What did Miller find? Even with the very primitive techniques that Miller used back then, like paper chromatography, Miller went on to show that fundamentally crucial molecules that are responsible for leading to the formation of more complex biomolecules could be found in these reactions. Here are four amino acids, glycine, alanine, glutamic acid, and serine. And he also showed that you can form even more simpler hydroxy acids like formic acid, glycolic acid, including your urea, which Wohler showed in 1828 that you could very readily form by chemical reactions, simply from chemical reactions. So once Miller and Urey experiment actually showed that you can indeed form these chemicals in the lab and proved the oparin haldane theory, it became so much more easier for subsequent generations of scientists, prebiotic chemists in particular, because that particular demonstration in 1953 led to the emergence of a field called prebiotic chemistry, which is something that we do in our lab too. What these very cool colleagues of mine in a few different from a few different parts of the world have shown is that you can go from the same fundamental ingredients in the prebiotic soup to forming precursor molecules that lead to the formation of amino acids, which eventually can oligomerize to form proteins, your cool biomolecule in the cell that facilitates a lot of functions in the cell. You can actually form the precursors of nucleic acids, which are called nucleosides, that can lead to the formation of the genetic material in the cells. And you can also form precursors that essentially form the simple membrane monomers that eventually form the skin around the cell. So all of this shown in the last 60 years. Interesting. That's a huge amount of progress. Yeah. But um, I mean, you've shown us how what these molecules look like. Um, but what did they, like? I, I still wouldn't classify this as life, and I don't think you would either. So, what did the earliest forms of actual life look like? 
So like I uh, have alluded to in some previous slides and I showed in that video, these molecules had to come together to form the most primitive of cells that we refer to as protocells. And I'm very happy to share that protocells have been demonstrated in the lab to show features of life. They can grow, they can actually divide, and they can also undergo a very primitive version of evolution, essentially Darwinian evolution, in a test tube. So have we created life in the lab yet? Not quite. We are very close to that, hopefully in the next decade or so. But having said that, these protocells, as I've alluded to earlier, do not leave any uh, signatures that we can systematically go back and figure out, wow, way back in four point, around 4.2 billion years ago, these existed. It's very hard to say. So where then can we get the uh, fundamental evidence from that earliest life forms did exist? And for this, we need to sort of go back to around 3.5 to 3.9 billion years ago, wherein from your protocells, you had this common ancestral community of cells come about and they were doing a lot of interesting things, but eventually they led to the formation of this single uh, celled entities called prokaryotes. These do not have a nucleus, please remember that. So they, they have all their molecules floating around within the cell, but there's a lot of complexity there that I won't get into, but these very interesting life forms are the oldest evidence that there was life on earth around 3.9 billion years ago. And how do we know this? We know this because of these extremely cool rock-like structures that you see on the top panel here. You have to trust me when I say that they are alive. These are called stromatolites. Stromatolites are essentially a product of the crosstalk between microbiology and geology. What do I mean by that? Cyanobacteria, like the ones that I showed in the previous slide, these beautiful green cells, uh, cellular structures, these kind of come together from the sticky goo and the sticky goo pulls in dust and grain and sand and over billions and billions of years, they form these hardened rock-like structures. And in the lower panel, you actually can see these striations, which one can see when you cut open one of these stromatolites every alternate black layer is coming from the geological component and every alternate golden looking layer is coming from the microbiological component. So they look very dead, but you can actually scrape out and look, look under the microscope and they will end up looking a lot like your, uh, uh, like your uh, uh, prokaryotes, like your bacteria that you know today. And uh, the super cool thing is till now, all of the processes that we've talked about happened under anaerobic conditions. And aerobic conditions meaning no oxygen. There was absolutely no oxygen on the early earth. These organisms exist to date. They're present amidst you and me and they survive in niches which are very low in oxygen or don't have oxygen at all. But what did they end up doing? They end up doing, doing exactly something that plants do even today. And that is photosynthesis. They end, up, they end up using sun's energy and they take water and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They cook up these, uh, they cook up food, which essentially allows them to survive, gives them the fuel to carry on all the metabolic processes. And as a byproduct, they spit out oxygen, just like plants do today. This is the oxygen that is thought to have oxygenated the early earth. So over the next billion years or so, billion and a half years or so, oxygen started accumulating in the atmosphere and all the oxygen that you see on modern earth is thought to have completely come, completely is, is thought to have completely resulted from a consequence of this uh, kind of photosynthetic like process. And uh, so once this happened, what happened? A bunch of archaea, which we talked about, the third domain of life, which exists only in, under anoxic conditions or low oxygen conditions, some of them got completely poisoned and killed. But a lot of them live in niches where it is completely protected from oxygen and they exist very much on our earth even today. So many of them survive. But there was this beautiful crosstalk between prokaryotes and archaea. And it's thought that this archaea gulped up a bacteria, this is called the endosymbiosis theory, to essentially lead to the emergence of slightly more complex cells around 2 billion years ago. And this is that clock coming back here again showing that if you noticed we when we originally saw the clock we only saw the oldest known rocks that existed around four billion years ago since then 
you've now gotten evidence of the oldest forms of life, that is the prokaryotes. And subsequent to that, you are now seeing that around 2 billion years ago, slightly more complex cells, which have a very defined nucleus, as is shown by this round blue blob on the top uh, panel, these came about. And soon, these community, of, these cells started forming community of cells, and the community of cells had a lot of crosstalk between each other, essentially leading to what we now know as multicellular life. And here is an example of uh, a, a class of organisms where originally multicellularity is thought to have emerged, the coanoflagellates. So this is how all of this is thought to have happened. And once the multicellular life came about, much more complex life could have essentially come about after. That's super duper cool. So I'm just trying to put all this together. So we've gone from all just sort of basically chemistry all the way to biomolecules to single celled uh, and, and this sort of multicellular life. So how did we get from here to sort of the next big stage to what laypersons like me would classify as creatures or beasts? So what is very interesting is that uh, emergence of multicellularity is thought to have allowed for something really cool to come about, which essentially completely changed the way um, uh, uh, complex organisms eventually populated the earth. The emergence of sexual reproduction somewhere along, along the line from when the multicellular organisms emerged and there was strict sort of uh, uh, segregation of functions very quickly sexual reproduction also emerged, which is then thought to have led to these periods in the early history of life, which was uh, completely, uh, uh, which were where you could see this menagerie of strange creatures on the planet. For example, Eddie Akaran period between 540 to 590 million years ago, you had all these very um, non-vert, invertebrate, no vertebral column, looking uh, leaf-like, fern-like structures on the ocean of the floor. But subsequently, there was this very important event which the geologists called the Cambrian explosion. It is predominantly thought to have uh, been facilitated by the emergence of exoskeleton. Exoskeleton is an outside skeleton layer. And what that allows for is now the organism is able to tolerate much more harsher conditions much more readily than when it did not have that exoskeleton. So with the emergence of the exoskeleton, there was this complete explosion in the number of branches in that tree of life. I showed you a very, very simplistic cartoon version of it. If you actually look at the real tree of life, it is, so it's got some crazy number of branches and the crazy number of branches is thought to have evolved around the 480 to 540 million years period, which is called as the Cambrian, it's, Cambrian, uh, it's called the Cambrian age. And then came the reign of the dinosaurs, one of the coolest, periods that a lot of us sort of completely are enamored about. That is because you go all the way from that uh, crab and scorpion, uh, scorpion like creatures to this unbelievable, unbelievably complex, really huge creatures like the Bayan yeah? really giant organisms. And they ranged in shape, uh, they ranged in shape and size. I mean, the smaller ones were really small and the larger ones literally, I mean, were huge. So there was this amazing amount of evolution that led to this complex set of organisms to come about between, I shouldn't call them organisms, creatures to come about between 25, uh, to, between 60 to 250 million years ago. Unfortunately, they couldn't last forever. The dinosaurs don't walk amongst us now, right? What happened? A very important event called the Cretaceous tertiary mass extinction happened which was initially triggered by this um, asteroid that struck in the southern part of Mexico. And that particular event led to generation of so much of energy on the planet that it also led to this intense volcanic activity that happened right under our feet, or rather right under my feet on the Deccan, in the Deccan Plateau. Between these two crazy events, it was like a double whammy and it completely wiped out the dinosaurs. So then what happened? All the big creatures were gone. What this meant is some of the smaller creatures, like this mole rat that's shown on the top panel here, that basically survived this cataclysmic uh, sort of event, came out and could thrive. And it evolved eventually to what we see today, which is us. So once, it, once, once again, we go back to the clock. We saw that the 
at around 2 billion years ago, 2 2.5 billion years ago, you had the slightly more complex cells coming about the eukaryotes, which is what you and I are made of. And from then on, very quickly, there was an amazing increase in the complex, complex organisms that came about on Earth from single cell eukaryotes to multicellular organisms and boom, to the dinosaurs. And there was this wipe off, wipe out event, which then finally led to our appearance, right? Evolution of that mole, mole rat like thing to humans. When did this happen? Very close to midnight, just a few seconds before midnight. And this, I think, is an extremely important about super close to midnight. Prior to that, prior to that, it was not the reign of the dinosaurs, it was the reign of the single-celled organisms. And once we plunder and pillage Earth's resources, we'll be gone, but the single-celled organisms will survive. Nonetheless, the process of evolution of complex organisms is very non-trivial, and the process of evolution of super complex creatures in this space prior to us is unbelievably sort of, it, it's an unbelievable uh, uh, process and one should be extremely careful in my opinion to think about this and to remind ourselves that what we understand about all of these processes that we talked about thus far, the transition from chemistry to biology and the evolution from the smallest single cell organisms to humans, all of this happened over very large time scales. Hence, we really need to appreciate that the process of emergence of life is non-trivial and maybe our planet might be the only one that harbors life as we know it. Maybe we'll eventually within our lifetimes find something else that can harbor life. We do not know, but it's super important for us to be ultra careful about saving Earth, about being careful about how we treat our planet. Fascinating stuff. Thank you so much, Sudha. So we're way, way, way out of time. So uh, if I could ask you really quickly, uh, before we get onto the Q&A, uh, to maybe spend just 30 seconds to a minute just telling us a little bit about uh, your lab and how you do work here and your field work uh, here in India. So very quickly, we are not alone, uh, thankfully. Uh, just as we are not alone, uh, I mean, we otherwise, li li if you think about life, we, we might be alone in the universe, but otherwise, astrobiology-wise, we are not alone in India. There are a few other institutes where very cool research happens. You have the Indian Institute of Astrophysics in Bangalore, where, the, where they do uh, very interesting astrophysics and cosmology that you know, feeds off in, uh, that kind of uh, brings in inputs to astrobiology research. A new center for excellence in astrobiology has been started in Amity, Amity University, where you have planetary scientists and you have a few uh, chemists and other engineers that have come together to try and understand certain aspects of astrobiology. Physical research laboratory in Ahmedabad, been there for a long time. And here people are very interested in studying the molecules in the interstellar and the circumstellar medium. So a lot of uh, planetary scientists and astrochemists there. Birbal Sani Institute of Paleo Sciences. Paleo gives it away. A lot of people interested in paleontol paleontological aspects. And here is where we are situated, which is ISO Pune, where tomorrow's science start, starts today, or rather eight years ago, which is when we started the lab. And in our lab, we try and ask a lot of these questions that allow us to understand how life emerged on Earth. Interestingly enough, we don't just stay in the lab. We very recently also started to do, do uh, also started to do field experiments. It started in 2016 when we went out on this expedition to Ladakh, which is an astrobiologically relevant site right here in India. And we go do experiments there, bring back samples from these hot springs to do experiments in the lab. So it's been a fun ride thus far. Amazing stuff. All right, let's go on to our Q&A. So this is going to be pretty much rapid fire. Um, I'm, I'm gonna clump the questions together if things are similar. So here's our first question from Alok Arunam. Uh, is there evidence that life evolved in the interstellar space and was brought to Earth? Uh, so I think uh, this is one of the questions that I get asked in every uh, outreach talk that I give. and. Uh, he is alluding to a hypothesis that is out there that is called panspermia, which posits that life formed outside and was delivered onto Earth very early on. It is a possibility, it is a hypothesis, you know, a hypothesis is one till it's proved otherwise. Unfortunately, there's absolutely no proof for that. There is enough proof that biomolecules uh, can form in the interstellar and circumstellar medium and can ride on these comets and me, uh, meteors and can be delivered onto it, but to date we haven't been able to show that these comets or meteors actually harbor life as we understand it. Interesting. Um, second question from Vamsi Krishnan. 
uh, how do fossils of microorganisms form since there are no hard bones for minerals to fill in? So the only reason uh, the stromatolites are, can be the kind of, can provide the kind of evidence that they do is because they protect the microorganisms within the geological layers. If those geological layers, the striations that I showed you, alternate black and gold striations, if the black striations didn't exist, the gold, uh, the, 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 the components of the golden striation, which is essentially the microorganisms, wouldn't sort of retain their, I'm not saying they're alive alive, I'm sorry if I indicated that, but they, are, they retain their structure to the point that if you scrape them off and use the right tools like high-end microscopes to look at them under the microscope, you can see cells just like you see, uh, I mean, that, just like you see in prokaryotes. You can see single cell organisms. Intriguing. Next okay. question. Actually, just to quickly add, one can also do isotope analysis and basically the isotope analysis also can give us a sense of whether the sample that you're looking at is a result of biotic processes or abiotic processes, lifelike processes or chemical processes. Interesting. Next question from Disha Mukherjee. Uh, how did primitive protocells assemble and replicate any sort of specific physical or chemical mechanisms? So this is a very interesting thing that's, uh, that she's asking. You probably should come visit us in the lab because that is exactly what we try and understand in our lab. Because one of the big things is to understand what are the different components that could have made the membrane or the skin. And given that you had a genetic polymer and you had these components that could make the skin, what are the niches and what are the niche parameters that allowed for the successful emergence of these protocells in the lab one? Two, once they did emerge, how can they grow and divide? And like I said, there are actually there, there, are, there is actually evidence for this. And this proof came from a lab at Harvard where Irene and Shostak actually showed that some of these um, vesicles, just like in modern day, you have competition between organisms. If resources are limited, the survival of the fittest happens. Something like that happens even in protocellular scenarios. Some of them grow faster than the others and the ones that grow fast can also replicate completely by asexual means. All they need is some kind of shear force or some kind of a high energy, uh, a high energy kind of light to be shown on them, and they can form these daughter vesicles. I'm happy to share these resources via scientifically speaking team. Super cool. Uh, this is our last question for the evening, so I'm going to actually combine two of them together from Naman Mishra and Isha B. Uh, the Ure Miller experiment. They they looked at were they trying to replicate something specific like hydrothermal vents or geothermal pools or something else. And I'm going to add on, since they're doing this, hydro pools, what's with the water theme here? Why do we look for water wherever we're searching for life? Okay, so first to answer the hydro question, hydro part of the question. Um, if, you look at, if you look at your fundamental unit of all life now, which is present in all three domains of life, cells, right? Cells are, cells are basically comprised of molecules which are in an aqueous medium. And the aqueous solvent is water. We do not have any other indication that there might be other solvents, at least on Earth, in which these fundamental units called cells can survive. Having said that, there are, uh, there are a handful of other solvents that, have been, uh, that are being explored as alternates, like formamide. And um, this is something that is holding a little promise, but I cannot speak too much more because it's still the evidence is really not great. And uh, to answer, what were they simulating? They were actually simulating an early Earth terrestrial ocean environment in their contraption that looked like that round giant uh, uh, flask, round bottom flask. They were trying to simulate a prebiotic ocean and they had the fundamental ingredients, inorganic ingredients present in there, methane, ammonia, uh, hydrogen gas, and those kinds of things. And they, simulated hot temperatures. That is what is thought to have been prevalent on the early Earth. It was not as beautiful and pleasant. It was 60 degrees at the very minimum and above, close to 100, 110. So they simulated those hot temperatures and that is how they kind of ended up doing the experiment. Very cool. All right, we're out of time. So thank you so much for today's discussion. I hope our audience has uh, enjoyed the session. Uh, you'll be glad to know that we had over 270 participants and over 100 questions. 
uh, throughout this. So let me just quickly call Anna back so she can run the quiz so that those who've been waiting to answer all of those questions and get the prizes can get their money's worth. Thank you so much, Professor Gupta and Professor Rajamani. This was a Thank very insightful talk. Thank you very much to the audience and to the scientifically speaking team to have me. Thanks. Thank you so much, Anna, for having us. Thank you. Thank you. So as a conclusion to today's informative session, we have a short quiz to test your knowledge. Remember that the top five winners will get very exciting hampers. So please stick around. Uh, on the chat feature, we have sent a link to, to the Google form. Click on that and the quiz will close two minutes after the seminar closes. So let's get on with it. Um, again, on behalf of Ashoka University, I'd like to thank all our participants for joining us on our third lecture of Scientifically Speaking. We hope that you've enjoyed this session. We would really appreciate your feedback on this seminar. So please fill this 30 second survey that will pop up on your screen after you leave the lecture as this will allow us to improve the future seminars. Follow Ashoka University on the Instagram and Facebook page for updates on the next lecture. Thank you. Have a great week ahead and see you next Tuesday to engage in scientifically speaking together.